suppose I put different textures and I'm going to put different colors. And how many of you are familiar with gilt creams? Okay. So a lot of you, this will be new. This will be new information on gilt creams. It's a whole different arena. And so loosen this up because I'll tap it back down when I'm actually doing the graving. Save a lot of time so y'all don't worry about me doing all these different shapes and stuff. I, I put different textures. Can you see this okay? Or what's better? Right here? Okay. So I've used different tools for different engraving and then we're going to color it all black again and then we're going to play with the gilt creams which is the fun part. But you can use different things to do different textures. Now I'll, do, I'll try and go one at a time. The first one here, these little round circles, they're actually burnt in with this eye tool. Uh, there's about eight, six different sizes of the eye tool. If you, want me to, if you want me to name drop the manufacturer or distributor, I can. These are sold through King Arthur Tools. Uh, and you can, you can use them wholly on and create the circle. You can do them on their side to do the fish, uh, fish scale type of effect. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to grain fill it so it pops the color within the, within the, within the uh, depression I've made. And like I said, there's three different sizes. I'll do this a little bit, but these tools are probably more expensive. These attachments are probably more expensive than the tools I use to put them in. Because I use a Dremel and a Harbor Freight. And I didn't bring the Harbor Freight because then I'd have to bring a big old compressor and you don't want to yeah. hear that stuff. So that's the eye tool. This is one of your standard Dremel type chisel bits. It's from a better manufacturer. It created this depression. You can turn it on its side. You can turn it completely flat. You can do all kinds of different things with these tools depending on how you present them into the wood. And majority of the time when I'm presenting these things in the wood, I'm two-handed. That's why you saw me with having this secured between there. And I was, you know, I'd go, you know, use both hands to keep control because you have to watch out for these things skating on you. Okay, so that's that one. This one right here, I didn't bring my burner, but this was actually done with a skew bit on a burner. And you just let it get it pretty hot and you just can just draw lines. I'm looking for your thatched effect, which is what I'm doing here with a different chisel. But you can do this with a burner. Matter of fact, when I'm, uh, I do a, on natural edge, I inlay a lot of turquoise, and I grind the turquoise to a dust, and I'll enhance any cracks with that skew bit to give me more space to make the turquoise a little bit wider. Because turquoise sells. Believe it or not, in Texas. How, how do you brush your? How do you powder your turquoise? I have a. <laughs> I wish I had the picture. There's a bunch of plumbing bits I put together. A what? Plumbing bits, oh. and you take. And I can't remember the exact sizes. You take one pipe with uh, threaded on both ends. You cap the bottom. You cap the top with a reducer to reduce the width. Then you take that width of pipe in there with a, with a smaller cap in it and you can crush it without the stuff going everywhere. Then you unscrew the bottom and you use sifters, but don't tell your wife you're taking her sifters. Get your own. <laughs> but that's how you build a crusher. And turquoise is a unique uh, stone to crush because not all, not all stones are color fast. Some of these stones that look green and purple, you crush them, they're clear. It's the refractive pop, cap, cap, uh, capacity of the stone. But turquoise is color fast throughout. So I have three little jars. I have the nuggets, and then I have the ones that are sifted, and then I have a third one, which is sort of in between, where I pick and pick apart. And I got my, pardon, you got a question? I'll, I'll finish that discussion. Okay. I do have a question. Uh, the turquoise I get, it has to be sorted because I get what they call the floor sweepings. Uh, there's, I think it's a place so I ordered it out in New Mexico, got a one pound bag, and you gotta pick the crap out of the turquoise. And 
but it's I had turquoise enough for probably last me <laughs> for quite a few years. So as I was off topic, <laughs> it's a good discussion. Yes, sir. And what you were talking about doing was filling something that you said you used a burner. Yes. What are you referring to as a burner? Where my wood, my, my pyrography. Okay, thing. just a wood burner. Wood burner with a skew tip on it, on on the tip. And that's what I used for that one. Uh, let's see the next one. Here's oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is called an Orbi cut. Can you see this? I'll turn it sideways. It's got two cutters on it. It is very aggressive, but it's aggressive for people to do heavy carving. All I'm wanting to do is carve little depressions. And this, this bit is probably four times, three or four times more expensive than this from Harbor Freight. And I don't use it so sparingly, I do not need a Fordham unless you really are dealing with a lot of quarter inch shaft stuff. Is that bit from Harbor Freight? No, this bit is, I think the last time I saw it was 70 or 80 bucks through Amazon. It's called Orbica. And it comes with the medium cutters on it. And I went and, at, per recommendation, got the less aggressive ones. Because again, I'm just trying to create little, I don't know if, how well you can see the little depressions in them, but they're sort of give a cut like that. Okay, uh, another new tool, uh, I got it on here because I'll demonstrate just a little bit. This is a new carving bit, and again it's through King Arthur Tools. Uh, they've done a lot of good work for Nick and they're bringing out tools. Actually, <coughs> you didn't hear me say this, but Nick found these bits and then <coughs> showed them to King Arthur and then they just started distributing them. This is actually a cutter that has many carbide tips on it, similar to a hunter tool. And so they're replaceable. So you don't have to throw the bit away, you just buy new, new bits. But it comes in the, uh, the round hunter bit, it comes in also a triangular or more pointed bit which I used on this. So, and I was probably a little too aggressive because I figured out real quick you can only go one direction with these. <laughs> so, you learn every step of the way. No backup capabilities. No backup capabilities. And so I did that with these. And then um, the last bit, and I assume a lot of you, or some of you are familiar with rotary chisel. Yeah. They've been at SWAT. And that's what this was done at, done with. With, rot uh, with the rotary chisel, just in and out, in and out, in and out. And again, that took about four or five minutes, tops. Uh, matter of fact, you want to see the end product of what that does. My buddy from Virginia uh, came to visit, and I had a piece of Madrone Burl. And he loves gnarly wood. And so that's the basic. This, this chisel technique is what he basically did around here, all the way around. And so this is where we're going to, is <coughs> creating a depression or, or a carving, then we're gonna give it a backdrop. And I just brought black today. It doesn't have to be black. It can be any color you wanna do. And you've seen the dye manufacturers, they're all across the rainbow. You pick what you like, you pick what you think will, if you're, in, if you're in the business, you pick what you think will sell, hence the turquoise. Uh, and then he covered it with a gilt cream, just highlighting the high points. And that's, the, I guess, the key point I want to get to is you have two different suffer surfaces you're going to treat. You're going to treat the surfaces that you've exposed, but you can also create the surface you've left up at a higher level. And so there's a different technique for dealing with each of those and we'll go through that on the storyboard and then I'll try and use one of the techniques on turning a shallow bowl once I face it off, get my recess, do my, giving him credit, Jimmy Clue's method of doing an OG curve on the back side of a bowl and uh, then we'll reverse it and do the treatment. So. 
First step is I wanted to show you, and this is something brand new that I'm trying, that uh, I was at Air, I was at Aramont this summer, unfortunately, for a two-week class and got COVID in the middle of it. Oh, wow. So I, you can imagine sitting in a dorm room 24 hours a day for three days until the guy you were riding with got COVID too and we just left. <laughs> so I missed the second week. But uh, that's life, and that's how things go. <clears throat> but th this was a new pattern of texture that Nick introduced that he basically is taking this little bit that is the rounded carbide bit and doing little circles. And if I do it right, it's going to give a notion effect. So that's, that's where we're going. So first I'm going to... Is that the Dremel? That is my Dremel that has an extension on it. <coughs> That get, let's, gives me a handheld piece rather than trying to hold this thing. Mama was good to me for Christmas one year. And I'm very fortunate because my wife can, I can never outspend my wife. She's got horses. So I got my Powermatic 3520C when I wanted it. That's nothing, George. My wife bought me a new lady for my birthday, so. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do the raffle before you start this? Next Let me thing? do this, and then I can color this. Then you can start raffling. Okay, sounds good. Because coloring is just me paper towel with black dye. Nothing that's exciting there. So I got my safety glasses on. Uh, not sure. Oh, could I hand it to you? Uh, don't know what speed. I got it towards the top on the speed level, but it's not like any of some of the other carvers like the Fordham that you can really crank it high. And all I'm going to do is just sort of a circular motion with two hands. extent of what it took to just do a couple rows of that. Now unfortunately I did not bring my Merlin and one of the main things I use, does anyone know what a Merlin 2 is? It's a little mini grinder. One of my favorite attachments to that mini grinder is this little jewel. And what it does is it spins at a high speed and it knocks all the chits out or a lot of them. And so you're not trying to get all that crap out of there that the carving does. Now, when I do it on here, I can just spin the lathe and hold this through it. But with this, uh, I'm just doing that. And these little tendrils, they really spread out as you got that Merlin going around. And again, that's one of my favorite uses of that Merlin tool. And so any questions, please ask as we're going along. Because I'm, I'm going to throw a lot of information and names and vendors and stuff that I've used and I apologize like I said in advance if I name drop too much but I like to give credit for people who've done things that have showed me the stuff. Can I see that last little bit that you used that you made the impression with? Yes. Okay. I'll try and pass it around but please don't drop it. It's, it's carbide. It does not take the ground well. Maybe, maybe if you set it over there on the show and tell table, if people want to see it, they can go over there. Yeah. And that way, don't pick it up. That way, it doesn't get dropped. Okay, I'll, I'll put I'll put the eye cutters and that bit and, and the chisel bit over there. What I'm going to do now, while y'all raffle off, is put a little black dye in all these. All right. 
You ready for the raffle, Andy? Yeah. Everybody get your tickets. Find your first and your last. Where'd my helper go? Alicia. <laughs> She might be playing with <coughs> All right. my daughter. I'll go. Okay. Go. Three, eight, zero. Three, eight, zero. Three, eight, zero. Okay, I got enough of these done that we'll be able to play in just a little while. <coughs> what we're going to go for is a shape similar to the one that was just raffled off. It's going to create sort of an OG shape back here, uh, and then we will have a thin rim bowl there. And so I've sort of roughed this out, uh, and then I'll show you how I approximate to get that OG shape. All right. Dip it. Let's listen. So first thing is, since I'm going to do a recess rather than a tenon, I want to sort of lay out where my foot's going to be, and I'm going to use the rule of one-thirds, and since this is about 14 inches across, I'm going to go a little bit stronger than two inches here to sort of define my foot. And so I've sort of defined the foot right here to start off with. I still got a little more material to take away, and then I will work on the recess after I start getting my shape in. All I've done to this so far is place this off to save us a little bit of time and a little bit of less of a mess. And then I sort of squared this off on the front. So <coughs> since I've got this, I'm going to give me a little bit deeper of a foot. <coughs> because one thing on doing recesses is you need a good, I'd say at least half an inch or more, of foot material before from where your recess is. 
Am I, um, am I making sense? If you, if you make the area between your foot and the recess very narrow, you have a high opportunity of splitting out that foot when you expand right. the jaws. So you need to make sure, first of all, the foot is deeper than your recess and that uh, your recess has got some meat behind it. Now, we're not going to, I'm not going to crank this thing on the recess that significantly, but it's a general rule of thumb is you've got to give yourself some space. So if you, even if you have to make <clears throat> the foot a little bit bigger, it's on a decorative bowl, it, it, it isn't going to matter. Because <coughs> I bet half the time it's going to be sitting up on its face in some kind of stand versus being laid down. And if it is laid down, it's not something you're going to serve grandma soup in. It's more often than not, it's going to be on a coffee table, sofa table, Christmas time. It may even have uh, ornaments in it or something like that. It's, 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 it's decorative. And I do a lot of the decorative bowls. I also do the natural edge bowls. And I do do some functional bowls. Uh, I've been doing multiple demos on wine stoppers. I do both acrylic and wood in the same demo. Uh, the other demo I've done is on square plates. And I will take, remember when North Woods used to be there and they sold those nice little thick blocks? I, they were a little pricey, but when you split them in half to make two shallow plates, square plates, it makes, it makes a big difference. And if it's highly figured, you don't do anything. If it's not highly figured, then you dye it. And I've, I've had success both ways, especially if you get some open grain wood on a dye job. How many of you have ever done ash or oak and done any grain filling? One, two, three. You need to, you need to really take a look at that because it's dramatic once you dye it with an open grain because the open grain gets much, much darker. But if you take a take a cream like a gilt cream or Jimmy Clues's cream he was selling for a while through Wood World, it really pops. I didn't. I wish I'd have brought. I didn't know if y'all did PowerPoints. I would have brought you some pictures of the different coloring we could do. But uh, uh, that's why a friend of mine up in Virginia, he had ties to uh, one of the uh, historical groups. And they took down an ash tree on George Washington's old farm called River River Farm. And the whole club up there are, are loaded with ash. And it was beautiful ash. It was he gave me at least a dozen bowls that had already been roughed out. And uh, a friend of mine, a high school friend of mine, her son just became a chief petty officer, just got promoted. And so I did one of those bowls off of George Washington's farm with red on the inside and blue on the outside, and they were they were ecstatic. So uh, anyway, uh, my journey in color is not just what we're going to do today. It is what I want to talk to you about. I've done the double dyeing like you have. I usually start with black because that'll pop the grain even more. But I, unlike the reds that James uses, I love this turquoise <coughs> in blue, but it's whatever your preference is. I'd like to add that George's gift on the bottle stoppers is on YouTube if you're interested in Oh, I did it for the Alamo Club. I guess they posted it. <laughs> I may have found it through the Alamo Club. Yeah, because we don't, we don't record. We don't have that technical expertise that the Alamo Club does. So, half-inch bowl gouge. I brought several because uh, I sharpen using Tormek, not Wolverine. I started with the Tormek attachment to my grinder for three or four years because that Tormek attachment to your grinder is 60 bucks. And, uh, and I already had the jigs, so it, it was, you know, it, it was reasonable. And then finally I took the plunge and bought the wet grinder a couple of years ago. But I love it. Everyone has their favorites. That's mine. So one thing I do on the Powermatic, how many Powermatic users we have? Okay, one thing Jimmy Clues clued me in on, because we've had him at our club, is on Powermatics, his number one safety rule is he turns the power down. Matter of fact, he hardly ever turns the power switch off. Because if you listen to some of the websites, the, the number one thing that breaks down in the 
A's and the B's is the power switch. From everybody, bang it. So unless I'm gone for the day, I don't turn power off. Because power's on right now. And it's always safer to start it up. Yeah. And I do speed to what I'm comfortable with. I am not a Jimmy Clue speed person. Not many people are. Thank goodness. Because they don't have his skills and talent. But, uh, I'm, so basically I'm going to face this off, give me a little bit deeper depression for the foot, and then I'm going to stop it, lay out how I do the OG piece. So that's where we're starting. Make one more check. It's on square. It comes on. My goodness, it's moved since I did this two days ago. It's about 1100 RPMs. I'm going to do this up. Jim Bob, I'll put the shield on if you want, but this is pretty stable. Okay. I'm bringing the tip right at center line and facing everything off. I'm going to plunge in here. That's about all the foot I'm going to need. Thank goodness my wife trimmed my beard for me. Okay. Bring it down. Okay, so I have my generally where my foot's yes. I'm sorry, what is that you're turning? Cherry. It's cherry. It's cherry. Very dry cherry. It's been sitting in my shop. I bought it dry and it's been sitting in my shop for at least two or three years. So it's as dry as it can be. <laughs> That's why you're seeing what you're seeing. So Jim, Jimmy, when he taught me this, uh, again, going to those workshops, he says, divide your piece in thirds. So like I said, it's seven inches. So that's two and, two and a quarter or so. So I've got the foot here at almost two and over two and a half. So I'm good shape for the foot. Again, these are not exact calculations. They are guidance at best. So then the next third would be at the at the four inch range right around here because there's two and a quarter I'm going to go to almost five and then there's thirds right here here's your center line here here and here okay second measurement is eyeball he says halfway between the first measurement and the second measurement so that's right about here and the third line he wants you to draw is how much of this do you want to leave exposed as your lip? So how far do you want to bring it to, to where you're going to have that shallow uh, rim, that, that long, you're going to have a wide rim bowl. So the, you don't need all this meat behind that wide rim because the cavity is for the bowl is only going to be about this big. So I'm going to create an OG shape and so I only want to bring my line up to here. And so I slowly start the lathe up so this measurement, this measurement, this is the one I'm going to work off of, right here. Okay, and where's my, here's my mark for my lip. This is literally how I do every one of them now. So I, I know where I'm going. And so from there, I'm going to take my bowl gouge, and I'm going to start doing a concave cut. I'm going to create an, a concave shape because I always fretted on how to do this and he's made it easy for me, at least to lay out. So not everyone's the same, but uh, this is the way, as I do tell people when I do bottle stoppers because people always come and say, well, you could do it this way. And I said, you could, but this is the way I do it. <laughs> and sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't, but some, some people just like to argue. I don't know many of those, but 
So I got my two frames of reference, which means if I get too close to one, I just lighten up the cut as I go to that edge or, st or take a deeper cut as I'm going. So I've got my, on my hip, and I'm just start presenting here. I'll start at the edge. See, I'm just rotating my hips. the two lines. I, I sort of look for if I got any ridges and I got a little bit of one right here so I'm just going to try and scrape it a little smoother and then we'll go and feather the other edge in. Just doing sort of a sheer cut. Doing a sheer scrape. Notice the sheer scrape gets you these kind of shavings. So this is what you're looking for. And that surface is pretty, I'd start, I'd start with probably 120. And uh, I don't see any open torn grain. I had a little bit of a ridge here I'll take out in just a minute. But now I, I need to fully define the foot where I want it to be, which is sort of semi-defined. And then to finish the OG shape, all I have to do is shape this little curve over, and I'm there. So I'm not going to do the recess yet. That's coming up next. <coughs> but this uh, edge right here is a little rough, so I'm going to take one of my smaller bowl gouges, which is, this is a one-way, double-ended. Since I'm coming to demo, I got the Allen key, so all I got to do is reverse it and keep it sharp. And so I'm going to start with this one and go back to that one. So here's my defined foot. Now I'm going to feather this in. And I'm just going to use scraping strokes, pull strokes. And I'm eyeballing this shape because I want a nice, nice curve. I got this little spot here I still was worried about. questions on the OG shape. See how it's just two lines, three, four lines, and you've got your shape laid out and you're ready to go.
took so much of the guessing out of my perspective. Okay, now it's time for a good old recess. And our buddy James Hampton, he's got a, he's got a laser cutter. And at one point he asked everyone in the club what, what chucks they had. And for 10 bucks he would laser cut your outside inside measurement for chucks and tenons. Michael, and for recess. Are you paying attention? I was just pouring out. <laughs> <laughs> I've, yeah, I've made some. Yeah. And I mean, if you sweet talk James, he may give you, he may sell you the vector drawing that he uses. If someone's got a CNC or a laser. I have both. <laughs> well, maybe Jim Bob can sweet talk James. Because he's got the vector drawings from Vic Mark, Supernova, one way. Cool. And, but he, he is a master at that laser. He's a master at everything, I think. Yeah. We are very fortunate in our club that we have three different individuals with their own sawmills. One of them being James Hampton. Okay, now I'm going to create a recess. Uh, I should get my pencil out. I got my center marked. Really nice. That's, that's the minimum. That's the maximum. This chuck I've got, Axminster, it's got 50 millimeter jaws. It's, same, it's similar measurements because this is my old Nova G3 chuck thing. So th there's my outer. There's my inner. So I gotta be somewhere in between those two. <laughs> the check I'm using is a new one, at least in the US on the market, it's the Axminster. It's the newest Axminster. Uh, I brought it with me today. I've got some, I got a big mark. And I think I still have one of those supernovas. As you're getting started, I was always watching for the Woodcraft sale on the supernovas and uh, would always buy another chuck because like everyone else, I hate changing. So uh, anyway, I'll go about this. I'll have to do a little bit in through here, through here. I am not worried. I, one thing I did learn from Mahoney, because again, he we had a lot of people come to our club, thank goodness. Uh, the center point on these recesses does not, the recess does not have to be dead flat, but the center point of the recess does have to be obviously below the foot. So that can save you that millimeter from going through the bottom sometimes. So you can leave it a little domed on there. And it actually looks pretty good. But you still have to leave it obviously below this, otherwise you're gonna have a rocking, rocking bowl. So you start inside where I'm going. This is where you will, can watch your, your tool skating. The infamous final cut. Okay, 
Let's see how we're doing. Let's see. Let's see, you know. see you got, I got space. So I'm good, that, I'm good from that perspective. I still have not got and dressed this recess to where I need it to be. It still needs to be a little bit of a dovetail in there. So, I admit I have an addiction to tools. <laughs> All I do for this is, this is used from just tenons and recesses to give me the dovetail I'm looking for. One use tool. And I bought it. You can make it yourself if you get the right dimensions of your dovetail. All you need is some time on a grinder. So, spin it. Now this gets a little grabby, so. That's it. How deep is that? Three eighths? Three sixteenths? I mean, something like that. Yeah, it's not much. I mean, this this small piece on a recess, you're not going to need that much. And uh, <clears throat> we should be good. I, I do need to give it a little bit more of a flat here, which I'll just do a little scraping cut. I still need to finish up the foot. Let me go back. And then I'll show you one of the reasons I bought this Axminster chuck. So right here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometimes I do that when I talk too much. I'd be sanding, but I'm not going to sand because that's the most boring thing to do. Well, I, well, when I take this back, uh, how many people know of a long work chuck? Most of y'all know what a long work chuck is? Okay, a long work chuck, okay, you, how many are familiar with coal jaws? Long work chuck is sort of like cold jaws, but it won't beat your, beat your knuckles up as bad. <laughs> it's an attachment, and it has a dovetail attachment go right into your 50 millimeter chuck, and it has little round rubber knobs that you can adjust on the fly. You don't have to move them up and down. And it adjusts, and then you screw them down, and then you can work on the backside. So that's what I'm going to do when I sand this, is what I was getting to. Okay. <clears throat> Now I just got to take this off. I won't do what I do in the shop and put it in reverse. <laughs> Spin it off. <laughs> okay. Uh, the nice aspect of this axe miniature truck is it's the reason I bought one. I don't know if I could afford a second one. Is this? It sure beats the woodworm screw because hmm. it is dead center every time. You're not fiddling trying to get that woodworm. I never could, and I've tried forever and ever. 
but I like this. It has also has a place place attachment that will go right in here as well. So I uh, have no affiliation with Axminster, I just like the chug. And this serves as the brake tool as well. Downside is it's very heavy, which is probably a good thing. But I'll set it over there on the table for everyone else to look at it as well. Well, I do need this on. What am I doing? I'll, I'll set it up later. Pardon? You're an angle file. <laughs> you like the X-Mister? No, I like Vic Marks too. I, I like my Vic Mark with uh, the extra extended jaws because I do so many bowls. Question? Um, it looked like you had a spacer on there. Yes. That's because that was so thin. It appeared to me, you know, I'd be sure to throw the thing across the room if I didn't have more one screw into that. You know, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but this is very dry wood. Okay. It was very secure. Wet wood is a problem on certain screws. You're right. It, it could spin them up. Uh, but I haven't had that problem with those. I've actually used on four quarter material or one inch material, two spacers. And I only had about that much screw. Now I started off and got it round and got everything done. I did all my work with the tailstock pulled in, but it, it still works. And then once I got the, you know, it shaped the way I wanted to, I just pulled this tailstock away just to trim up the tenon. So, I mean, it's six of one and half a dozen the other. You just got to be safe and think about it. Uh, if this had been a bigger piece, I'd have had the tail stock up and working on it. Let's see how well I did. Come on, George. Get a little smaller. on the bitter edge, which is good. I'll take the rock off, because that's not a pretty sound. It's running pretty true. Okay. You don't have a Live center? Look in the, Look in the door. Oh, in the door. Oh, in the door. Okay. Ah, there it is. Just till I get started. And it doesn't hurt. You know, the one way live center that this is mimicking, yes. these don't work. I mean, the threading is different. Is that right? I, I have both, but I haven't noticed that yet. So hack me off one day, because I couldn't find one of them. Anyway. Uh, play this sort of by ear, but I'm going to create a wide rim, something like this size, and I'll true up this edge to get it nice and clean, and uh, then I won't go any further until we start decorating, because I want to keep the mass here, and uh, I want to give myself a clean edge after I put all this messy dye in there and everything, so that uh, we, can, we can finish it up. So I'm going to go back to another half inch with full gauge. Start turning again. Enough. 
Okay, the edge I'm going to raise up a little bit before I start diving down into the, into the bowl. You do not, typically you do not want them dead flat across. That just does not, I forget how Jimmy said it, but basically not pleasing to the eye. And you do not need, and I wouldn't recommend to get these lips razor thin, because two things. First, you're going to get a lot of vibration, and that just starts tearing up your turning. And second of all, if you don't like what you look at, you just turn it off. Because, believe me, I've turned that bowl you got today that I put in the raffle. It got turned off a time or two, because it just didn't like the effect the way it went. So, uh, no, one's, no one but a turner is going to see how, comment on how thin it is. So, I've got that sort of curved now. Now I'm going to start working on it diving down. It doesn't have to parallel what you did on the back side, but it's got to be something along that line. I'm great with some space for me to work. generally like an overhand grip unless it gets too hot from the wood coming off. I see a lot of nodding on there. A nice beginner tip that I got from uh, watching a Glenn Lucas video was on Sometimes you, you, people are asking presentation on your tool, what angle, how you do it. He said, let's make it simple. I'm not going to tell you the number of degrees. Take a, and you can see the black mark in there. It's very faint. He said, he, he took a Sharpie and put, it, put a line down, down the tool. He says, you turn it till you don't see the line. And it's a great beginner tip because too many times people are worried about degrees. Just draw a line there, and when you can't see it, you're at a good angle. see that we've got a surface that's going down and what we will do is after we get it colored I will show you how I approach and create that edge which is just 10 seconds with a parting tool uh, and then we go from there uh, I do normally I've got these very sharp edges and I hate those but that's dealt with with 120 sandpaper going like this and it's the safest and you don't skate it you won't chip it or anything else I, again, I didn't bring sandpaper, and uh, with all the food here, you probably appreciate that. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, so uh, got just a little bit of curve cleanup here over here before we go. That's not good. It's funny, all the things you do in your shop, you say, oh, well, you're sort of embarrassed when it happens to you here. <laughs> I 
nothing was as bad as I kicked off the year in my club doing a demo on Halloween uh, and uh, not Halloween, but uh, yes, using my one-way tool to make uh, nested bowls off a piece of wet wood. And I not only flew the bowl off the lathe, I flew it over the plexiglass towards the audience. That woke them up. <laughs> it may have been January, but they were fully awake from my demo after that. And of course, I'd never hear the end of it after that. So, okay. I think Jim Bob did something like that at SWAT this last year with his uh, MDF that he had. Uh oh, oh. Uh, that must be the same MDF he had at our club. He said you flew some MDF off, off your lathe? Oh, I've flown multiple things <laughs> off my lathe. <laughs> okay. Jim Bob, I have witnessed Duke Banjo on a power mount. <laughs> That's talent. <laughs> oh, he also he also one time put a divot on the outside of the bowl from the inside with a ring tool. <laughs> you should be a tool te uh, stress tester. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, now we're now we're now we're into surface treatment, and I'm going to get some tools out of the way because I'll knock them off, and then I'll be really mad that I have to reshape them clean that off the quill before I get it back so you don't have to clean the quill later on. Joe Johnson, former president of our club, lives off a golf course and he collects all the balls and then he takes a drill bit and drills a hole in all the golf balls and hands them out to the club to cover your, so you don't get a Turner's elbow. That's a good idea. Oh, and I want to take a survey because we always ask this when we're uh, a friend of mine when we're out visiting other turning clubs. Of the male turners, how many of your spouses are into quilting? Cool. It, it holds. <laughs> High percentage wise. Have you ever made little bowls for them to put their pins in? Not yet. Yeah. Well, actually, I have, but she doesn't. She uses the magnetic one. So. Oh, okay. Because my friend, he doesn't get to sell them because his wife gives them away, but he makes dozens of these little bowls that his wife puts those pin cushions in, and she hands them off to all her quilting friends. And I saw those little blocks of wood, and that's what reminded me of that. That's the size he's looking for. Okay. Let's talk about surface treatments as I clean this stuff off my. Because I never really covered much of this stuff. And now it's all dirty. We talked about this piece. It's done by. And I'll put them over some. Where's a good place to set them that people can look at them? Over there? Or over here? Okay. Again, this is, this is a Madrone Burl. And he just used the rotor chisel piece and worked around. He has somewhat of a pattern, but it's not exclusively, and it's not it's it's rhythmic, but it's not defined as strict definitions was. He used uh, I think he used a mouth atomizer. How many people know what a mouth atomizer is? Airbrush. It's not. It, it's a. It's it's a. It's a self-propelled airbrush. Yeah. A long-powered airbrush. <laughs> and he just. Yeah. You can find them on Amazon. They're all of ten or fifteen bucks, whatever. But you just stick the. You stick one end into the die and you blow in the other. Don't suck. <laughs> well, you only do it once. Yeah. <laughs> or you're gonna have colored lips. <laughs> but and it, it'll blow a pattern out. Uh, it isn't as defined and refined of a, as an airbrush, which we learned all this from uh, my buddy <laughs> Nick, and now he exclusively, no he doesn't, so I said take that back, he doesn't exclusively use airbrushes, he does use the atomizers when he wants a splatter effect. So he still uses the atomizers, but he was, that's what he was teaching with because airbrushes weren't prevalent in 2011 to him, or affordable. So, uh, again, black background and then he <coughs> lightly brushed on the highlights the gold gilt cream 
And I'll show you the gilt creams in a bit, because they are fun. And, but messy, but fun. So that's this one. That's true of a This is a wooden shield. A wooden shield. Did this in a workshop about three or four years ago, about three years ago. I used a little round Dremel piece to do all the indentations. Uh, this is a separate piece that was glued on top of it. These are buttons from Hobby Lobby. These are just wood strips that were cut off. You know, when we, you know, the, the wood came square, so we cut it on a bandsaw for, and then he just took strips and we cut them on the bandsaw, used the belt sander to shape them to where they fit concave, and screwed the suckers in. Excuse me for saying screw or suckers, whatever. Uh, this was turned separately first, and then I, I turned a recess so it would fit in easily. And then all covered up. That's a gilt cream. The, green, the blue is a gilt cream that was rubbed into the holes and then rubbed off. So that was a workshop piece. <laughs> I have another shield that I did in a different workshop. They're fun to do. And it's just the opposite of doing a platter. If you just rethink your recesses and how you're turning it, it's there. Uh, this is one of my prized possessions, and I just blew that in my eye. Uh, this is a Nick Agar piece. Uh, he and I communicate, have been friends. He's been to my home. He's been to our club. Uh, he gave this as a sign of friendship. It means a lot to me. But again, this is a piece of maple. That's all it is. He textured the back, some of it with the Sorby tool, which is easily done. You just hold the tool up at different angles and you can get different depressions. And then he has a series of punches. And I think he did this whole back, uh, I mean the, the turning and the carving piece in probably 20 minutes. But he's that good of a turner to do that. And then he airbrushed the inside. And this is again the silver gilt cream over the surface. It was all colored black and then he uses the gilt cream, and it's a, it's a very learned technique, because <laughs> I'm still learning. But you, you just brush the surface. If you press, it's gonna go into the depression. That's the, that's the hard trick to learn. So, all I ask is, I don't mind you picking it up, but just be careful, because <laughs> he turns light. What's your source of the gilt cream? Gilt cream, there's, there, there is two known manufacturers. One's easy to get to and one is very tough. The easy one is a company out of Georgia called Chroma, uh, God, what, uh, Chromacraft. They've been to SWAT. They were, uh, they, their, their product was in the Spiralcraft booth this year uh, at SWAT. So they make gilt creams, they make dyes, they make lacquers. Uh, Nick, they have supported Nick and they are a US company and they have supported the wood turning community. So that's why I usually buy most of my stuff. And I'll, sh I'll have the whole, not the whole cornucopia of different creams I have, but I'll have a bunch of them here, I'll show you. Uh, the other company is out of England, and it's, uh, it's a weird name, it's called Goldfinger, even though they come in multiple colors. But uh, they're tougher to get to because import, export, and creams and stuff like that. Uh, at one point there was one art supply house out of Florida uh, that sold it before Chromacraft came around. And I have a copies of each here, or I have some of the, each of their products here. Uh, so yeah, I, I really uh, like the Chromacraft people. They, like I said, done some real good things for turning, and their colors are extremely vibrant. They, are, they, they cut their teeth and made all their money making dyes and colors for the <laughs> Fischler community. And so, as you can imagine, they get some very vibrant colors coming from those folks, coming out for those folks. So, uh, I'm not going to pass this around. 
This is a piece I made for a furniture show. And it's, these four black pieces started out as one piece of wood that we turned and then quartered and then we started, started decorating. And I will tell you, my first iteration of decorating this was not this. Uh, I went nuts with, air, with all kinds of colors and airbrushing, because it was a workshop, what the heck, you know? And Nick pulled me aside and says, George, less is more. And it, it's, <laughs> I could see his point after, after, when I got to the finished product. It was cool doing each of the individual pieces with four colors and all kinds of textures. And so I got it home and I sanded it all off and started from scratch. Now, the turnings didn't change. Uh, these lines were done with a um, little Merlin II grinder, little mini grinder. Uh, the depressions were done with that Orbi cut, cut, Orbi cut tool. And then I have multicolors in here. Then I took the frame and did the Orbi cut, tried to create a little bit of a snake-like pattern, and then just highlighted them. And I submitted this for the as a display piece for the Texas Furniture Maker Show, and believe it or not, they actually accepted it. So, so I, was, I was around with a bunch of nice furniture that was worth 10 times what I was wanting for this. But hey, I, I made my mark. I did, I got into the furniture show, and then I finally got an article in AAW. I'll just, I don't think that'll slide. And the furniture maker and me had to do it with French cleats. So, if it ever did sell, they could mount it whichever way they wanted. Uh, my COVID workshop, this is the one piece that got finished. And again, this is a piece of ambrosia maple, and the project was to make a lidded bowl. And so I did two different texture effects on the lidded bowl. This is the circle cutting bit, and I, I, had, I used three different sizes of the eyelets, they're called eyelet bits, uh, trying to create a bubble effect. And then on the bottom side, I did try to do the ocean effect, but I didn't put a second color on there to really create the shimmer that Nick had on his pieces, and it fit. So that was a good thing. But you blended that one, right? You betcha. <laughs> the last little, there's two toys or two things I picked up during the pandemic. One, I didn't bring anything on, but since I was sequestered out in the country, I built a CNC machine which I have, I'm having fun with right now. The other thing is we took a course, uh, my, believe it or not, my wife and I, she got away from her horses long enough to take a course uh, on doing po epoxy pours. And so right now I am making a ton of what they call charcuterie boards. Yeah. And funny story about the charcuterie boards is this, this is not my best piece, so that's why it's still around, because uh, I'm probably going to sand it all off. Uh, I have, I'm from a big family. I got seven brothers and sisters. So one of my post-pandemic goals was I sent them a note in January saying, I am going to make you each your own personalized birthday present. And I can make you a bowl. I can make you a platter. I can do salt and pepper shakers. Uh, what would you like? And one, one of my, bro my brothers said, how about a charcuterie board? And I thought, that wasn't on the list. <laughs> and by the way, that, what's a charcuterie board? <laughs> and then what happened after that, because it was all being messaged back and forth, and then a second one said, oh, I want one of those too. And then a third one said, oh, yeah, charcuterie board. So I had to learn what a charcuterie board was. And at the same time, I found out this class that this lady from Alaska teaches, and she's been going all across the country for woodcraft because they're promoting her epoxy on how to do these epoxy pours. And so I've had a lot of fun learning ocean effect on epoxy pours. What, what kind of epoxy is that? The one that's promoted by uh, Woodcraft and what she demos and what she represents is called Maker Epoxy. And she, she says, and they purport it to be a slow cure. So it's not a five minute job, which gives you time to move this stuff around. So basically, 
you pour the epoxy in in lines and then you use your heat gun to move it around and to blend it. Hmm. But it's, it's an interesting concept. <laughs> if that interests you, you need to look up uh, Jess Crow out of Crow Creek Designs. Okay, so I'm going to move this back over here as an armrest to support me as I'm doing this. I'm going to lock this down. I haven't, uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, you've got about 18 minutes. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do then is I'm only on, I'm on going to treat one section. So you can see the effect on what I'm doing, okay? And then I'm going to go back to the storyboard and we're going to play with color. And, and work from here. Ah. Okay, so I still have this here. I need the bit I want to use. I've got the, the triangular bit. There it is. One handy tool to have if you're doing a lot of carving off the lathe. One thing you do not want to do, if at all possible, is take it off your chuck. Because it's tough to retrue those things up, and I am not that good of a turner, and you don't want your good work to go away. So, one of these carving stands that, and there are several people that make them. This is the one by Trent Bosch. Fits right in here. And then, what's nice about it, you lock it in. You can move this, you can spin it, you can move it, you can, Lock it in whichever way you want to address it because sometimes you want to be up here. If you're painting, you want it to be right there. So it's a nice tool to have uh, if you're going to do a lot of coloring and a lot of texturing and a lot of carving. And a matter of fact, it also comes with a sleeve that you can mount it externally. And I built a whole stand based on an old grinder stand that I can take this outside like if I'm spraying because uh, some of the Nick Agar stuff with the web effects and stuff, it gets all over the place. So I got a backyard decoratively colored. <laughs> but it's the dog run. Who's going to notice? So anyway, uh, well, the bits, the bit will run this direction. So I'm going to go in one direction this way. It's locked in. I should be safe, knock on wood shavings. But basically what I will be doing is, is drawing, I want to radiate lines out. get the idea. I'm not trying to get a fixed pattern. Some people like fixed patterns. Uh, one of the things I've had fun with, if you're familiar with the coil tool on your wood burners, Molly Witten sells one. If you're not familiar with it, if you take that, uh, what do I call it, the coil, coil bit on your wood burner, you alternate it, you'll create a herringbone design. One side, then the other, one side, the other, one side, the other. And you, then you can just brightly brush the surface with something like a green gilt cream, and it'll pop it. So I'll, be do, I'll do all the way around. Then I'd color it like I did the storyboard. Then I would come to it with the gilt cream, get all that done on my surface before I ever talk about going, out, going down here and finishing. 
because I'll even, after I get the guilt cream on, walk away for 20 minutes, come back, I will shoot it with one coat of shellac because I can spray shellac in the, off, in, the, in the shop without getting complaints. <laughs> Lacquer is a different story. Lacquer is outside. But I'll spray it with one coat of shellac, walk away another 20 minutes, clean up, pick up shavings, whatever, and then I will take my parting tool. Where's my parting tool? Oh, here it is. Custom handled parting tool. Thanks to Home Depot. And I will take it, I will look at sort of the angle where my bowl's going, and I will create me a shoulder. I don't need much of a shoulder, but you do not want to skate back across this stuff after you've got it colored, textured, and everything else. So let me just show you real quick, because I can always go back and change it, because I got a lot of meat here. And it is, it is a pretty piece of chair. So again. Oh, yep, I gotta get off the lock. And I would know where my green is but and all my colors at the end, but basically, I should say basically, my wife gets at me, I say that too much. I'm not trying to be aggressive. That's all I need to start a shoulder. Because I am not the best turner in the world, but even me having it turned the way it's supposed to, you can skate. And I've had problems. <laughs> One time I had this beautifully designed pieces with web effects, marbling on it, and colored and airbrushed down. And I was, I was blowing things out and the tip, the rubber tip of my blow from my air thing touched one spot and took all the paint off. Luckily, since I'm a tool junkie, I had a beading bit. And it had a decorative feature in the middle now of three beads. And it sold. <laughs> so, uh, any questions on this piece? Because now it gets messy. I didn't get everything colored black I wanted to, but I got enough of it that I think we can get across. The two things I'm going to focus on that are really cool are these, working on this ocean effect and this sculpting like you see on the shield, because I think there's interest there in that. And you'll get the effect, you'll get the concept of what I'm looking at. How many people keep around their old toothbrushes? Good people. Good people, because they are the best things for working into this stuff. Old, old toothbrushes. Or you go on Amazon and get a six pack for five bucks. So either way works. Here's colors. Talk about colors. Here's some of the Goldfinger, which you'll, you'll be lucky if you can find here domestically. Here's another Goldfinger. They have about three different golds, or four different golds. Here's some of the Chromacraft, and they're listening to their customers, because I have I yelled at them for, not yelled at them, but I suggested strongly that they didn't have a blue in their repertoire, and they got this blue sapphire now, which is just absolutely gorgeous. And they even have these new colors that are sort of a blend that go from a green to a gold, sort of a chameleon effect as you move it in your eye. And we'll, we'll play with that today. Uh, That's your gilt cream, right? These, these are all the gilt creams. And I am going to do it like they tell me to with gloves on. I typically don't, but then I have to wash my hands five times to get it all off. The consistencies aren't quite the same. Uh, some people swear by the Goldfinger. Uh, I can't, I'm not that much of an expert to know the difference. So I, I can't say that I know that I see a perceivable difference between the two. 
So let me get my gloves on, otherwise I'll have that stuff on me forever. I picked up the black dye two days ago and didn't realize the lid wasn't on tight. So I've become a little more self-conscious. I do have airbrushes. I just that's a whole different demo just talking about airbrushing. And you really need to see Jim Bob next year. If uh, Nick does his road tour, he's planning on coming through Texas, and I'll try and give you a heads up. Sweet. Because uh, he usually takes a circuit. He has to go by road bus because he's representing them now. Then he goes down to Colorado, and he comes back southern route to get to he, he now lives. He's How many people know Nick Agar? If you haven't, you need to look at his stuff if you're, into the, if you're excited about coloring. Uh, he was one of the last people that went through the apprenticeship program for wood turning when they still were, had that, in, that institution going on in England. So from a skill standpoint on turning, there's nothing he cannot do. But he gets his joy out of doing this kind of stuff. And he gets his joy out of, he's helped Chromacraft develop these. He's helped Chromacraft develop rusting compounds. So you can put a rust effect or iron effect, or, and uh, whether it's brass, whether it's iron, you can put any of that on wood now. And he's worked with uh, King Arthur to develop some of these tools. And like his, uh, the Merlin II has got his name on it almost all the time now. So, very talented. I, I think most of y'all have seen Jimmy Clues. From, I think Jimmy Clues is probably one of the best demonstrators I've ever seen. Nick is second. But when it comes to workshops, I think Nick is probably the best workshop uh, person I've ever had. So, George, anyway. what do you, again, is that <clears throat> black base that you put on? Uh, dye. Chromacraft wood dye. If you haven't been to the website, they, they have a lot of lot of product. It's black dye. I use Transtent. I, you know, you buy one of those bottles of Transtent, you get dye for the rest of your lifetime. Because it's a 13 to 1 or 16 to 1 dilution factor with uh, alcohol. So, uh, but the Chromacraft stuff, I, when I, I, I'm the president of our club, and, but plus I, I arranged all the demos for the last five years, and uh, we were we were fortunate enough that we uh, wrote some grant requests, and the grants were specifically targeted to bring national demonstrators in, and so we've been fortunate in our club to have everyone from Trent Bosch to Jimmy Clues to Nick Agar to Mike Dukoski, Al Sturt. I mean. The whole litany of the local. The only one I couldn't get there was Mahoney because he could traveling. But uh, he was the only one on my list left to go. But Mike's done multiple Zoom sessions for us. Is that an AAW grant that you're talking no. about? No. It was a local arts foundation. It was a local arts foundation, and luckily the president of the foundation was in our turning club. <laughs> but uh, we had to write. We wrote proposals, and they not only got us the national demonstrators, they outfitted us with a Powermatic lathe and five <coughs> Nova lathes. So we can literally pull. And we have a closet. You saw the closet at, the, at our uh, center. And we, we can pull seven lathes out in a matter of 15 to 20 minutes and do workshops. So like I said, we've been very fortunate. So. First thing to do is I'm going to put the blue uh, sapphire in both of these, right? These two right here, and I'm going to use use toothbrush, and that's going to get the lower depressions. And I'm going to take the white, take the paper towel, and wipe everything off the surface, leaving the depression. And I'll do several of these, and I can continue to go if y'all. If it's dinner time, hopefully. Uh -oh. I now have a blue Allen wrench. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe I'm not going with this. I know I'm going to come out. Into the line. <laughs> that is. I got to talk to them about that. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's such a gorgeous color. Let's see if I can get it out there. Any idea what they're using for the color pigments for the colors? No. Whether mineral or I do not know. Let's go with amethyst. Let's see if it's any better. With their, with their name, yeah, I thought, well, maybe. There we go. We're going to go with the amethyst. I'm going to need a couple coats of that. All we're doing is rubbing it in, trying to get it into the depressions. And, you again, this stuff... When, you, when I put it on my finger and do the highlights, you've got to try and protect things you don't want to get it on because <laughs> it's, it's like a lot of things with paint and glues and stuff. You don't want to... <laughs> the biggest lesson we learned in pouring epoxy is don't touch your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you've got a heat gun on it. Yeah, don't pick your nose. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know how hard it is to not do that. <laughs> Especially when you're focused on trying to move this and there. You're does this green dry hard or does it uh, stay green? It, it will dry. It dry. It, I don't know what the cure time is. It isn't the time we got here today. But uh, they do make a uh, solution that, you, you know, if you're spraying. You can spray in your air gun and it sets it, helps set it. But what I typically do is I'll, I'll, like I said, I walk away for 20 minutes and I'll touch it and then uh, probably hit it with a little bit of shellac. That way it doesn't go anywhere. See? I did that one. And then I'm going to move over here to one that's called blue violet. And I, I'm going to use this on the ocean effect. And see how it how it looks. I'm getting ready to rub that off as soon as I get this one done. So, should be good because I'm just breaking the seal on it for the first time. I need another toothbrush. Okay. see the multicolors coming through as you rub it in. Take some of this and also put it in these round holes.
you're just rubbing it off now? Or you I'm just rubbing it off the, uh, to well. get all the excess off. And it'll, it will take some off the tile uh, surface, but I'm not trying to take anything out of the depression except excess. But you can see, you can start seeing the effects you can get. Now, I should really let that dry, but uh, I know what I can do now. Moving right along. Vertigree. Things, things that are green. Hopefully this one's not dried out. Because I think I just used it. The way I, this, this is the first one I'm going to rub across the surface. I'm not going to try and push it into the inclination, into the indent, indentations. And so the way you do that is put it between your fingers and just rub it across. This is very soupy. Usually you put a dollop on your thumb and then just rub down to where you just have a slight surface level here. And I'm pressing a little bit too fast, but uh, there we go. And you can see the grass effect that I was trying to do here, hopefully. You don't want it too droopy because then it'll go in. this storyboard helps you understand because I'm not doing a very good job because I'm trying to be in a hurry. Okay. So you get sort of the idea on, the, on that effect. This club has had it. The last one I'll do is I'm going to put a top coat on these two that I pushed underneath. And hopefully they've dried enough that it won't blend in. Okay. What do you think? Silver or gold? Or yellow gold? Silver. Let's do silver. silver. Okay. Silver. So I'm going to take silver. Uh, to give you a contrast, I'm not going to touch these two. I'm going to put the silver on these two so you hopefully see where we're going. The gold finger seems to keep its consistency better. And I know. Chromacraft is working on that, but again, it's a light brushing, but you can see the facets coming out, and I think that, that is the cool effect of using that Orbi cut, and yeah, no, it's too much, but I am just so lightly brushing it, and one of the secrets I learned on doing this stuff, you're never going to get a first time through it perfectly. It's going to look a little splotchy, so you need to do it. Again, go get a Coke, go to the bathroom, do whatever, and then come back and look at it again. Because if you try and do it fast and do it thorough, you're going to push it in the cavities. We've seen it too many times. Have you ever used the stuff called rub and buff? Did not like it. Uh, just personal, personally, I'd rather use the, the clues cream into the if it's in, into an open grain, yeah. or use this stuff. So you can see sort of the shimmer of the ocean effect coming here. Hopefully. But again, I'm, ju I'm just grazing it. And when you start to seal that with some sealer or lacquer or yep. something over that, yeah. does it bleed into it? 
Not if you give, give it time. I'd say give it an hour or two to let it set and dry, and then you're good to go. I haven't had an issue otherwise. So how, what do you think? That's good. So, before I make a mess, I'm going to take, my, take both these gloves off. And I think that's about it. I think I'm at my, I'm at my time limit, aren't I? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. I did it. Did it okay. All right. Thank you.